thank you so much, Robert. And uh, thanks very much for choosing me and, and inviting me here. So it's a real honour to have the uh, opportunity to come here and share ideas with you. Um, uh, as Robert said, uh, originally um, I had a background in university social science, um, but oh, what's happened? There we go. Um, but yeah, for more than the last 10 years now, um, I've been working, um, helping to run at this small farm here um, in the southwest of England. Um, uh, so this is pretty much my day job, and uh, it's been actually a very long time since I gave an academic presentation, so uh, please do forgive me if it's not as polished as the ones that you're used to. Um, Anyway, I got into doing this essentially um, out of the feeling that the way that we were doing the, 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 the food and farming, the mainstream food and farming system was getting a lot of things wrong, leading into a lot of environmental problems. Um, and so I felt um, and still feel that small scale local farming of this sort can offer perhaps some of the solutions. Um, but it, it didn't take me too long uh, doing this before um, I realised that uh, no matter how many squash we grew or pears we grew, I didn't seem to be solving too many of the world's problems. Um, and so I started, I started writing the blog um, that Robert mentioned, um, Small Farm Future, really mostly for my own purposes, just to um, try and think through what some of the structural obstacles to a more sustainable food and farming system were. Uh, much to my delight, um, the blog um, has um, generated a fair bit of interest, um, uh, some quite interesting commentary, commentary um, and led to various opportunities, one of which uh, is a book contract that I have uh, recently just signed with the publisher Chelsea Green, um, originally entitled also Small Farm Future, the, um, the book of the blog, which I'm sort of just in the process of writing at the moment. And what I want to do today is, is just sort of focus in on, on one part of the, of the book, or sort of just a few of my ideas that I'm, I'm trying to develop in the book. Um, but just by way of um, introduction, I'll just give a, a very quick overview of the book um, uh, structure. So it, it falls into four parts, and the first part um, is called Ten Crises. Um, Ten crises that I think we're facing in the contemporary world. Um, I'm not going to say anything about any of these. I'm sure many of you here know more about um, many of them than I do. Um, but I guess the view that I've taken is that taken together, um, these uh, potentially, there's a fair bet that these are going to push us into some very different um, types of politics and very different types of economics to the ones that we've been used to um, in the past. Um, and in a sense, the book is, is an attempt, it's a kind of speculative futurology to try and embrace um, that, those possible changes and, and make the best of them as, as I see it. Now, speculative futurology is, um, uh, is a little bit disreputable as a thing to do in academia. Um, luckily for me, I don't have any particular academic reputation that I need to safeguard. Um, so I'm hoping that you'll kind of embrace my... Uh, my journey here and, and sort of help me think through how um, how these uh, you know these these various crises might unfold and how we can try and uh, turn the narrative as, as best we can into something positive in the future. So uh, essentially, my argument is that uh, one, one of the, the the best way we can go is uh, towards a small farm future. Um, and in part two of the book, I try and lay out what that might look like, um, an argument for a much stronger focus on local agrarian livelihoods as a way uh, that we organise ourselves economically, and I sort of go through the implications of that, essentially um, more of a focus on, um, uh, more of a horticultural focus, uh, a more labour-intensive focus, on horticultural production for local needs rather than agricultural production for global commodity markets. If we were to move down that route, that would imply um, 
a very different kind of society uh, to the ones that we uh, typically live in in countries like the UK or Germany. So part three of the book, I, I talk a little bit about what that kind of uh, social order might look like. Um, pardon me. And then in part four of the book, I talk a little bit about how we might get politically from where we are now to that small farm future. Uh, and it's really that this part four that I want to focus my comments on today. I haven't actually written this part of the book yet, and my ideas for it are somewhat jumbled in my mind, so I'm hoping that uh, by presenting some ideas, you know, having some exchange, you might help me sharpen up my focus, ready to write something. Um, So one way of characterising, or the way that a lot of people pejoratively characterise uh, the sort of focus I take on local agrarian livelihoods is to call it peasant utopianism. Um, and I think you know, utopianism can mean two different things. One is this sort of notion that some people fall prey to that back in the past, before modernity, before capitalism, we all lived this sort of lovely, happy peasant lifestyle close to the land. That's not what I'm arguing, it's not what I think. Uh, really, I'm trying to articulate this as a contemporary response to contemporary problems. The other, perhaps more interesting way of thinking about utopianism is that it tends to be a politics where you sort of dream up this perfect political system sort of in your head or in your study without really a program for how you're going to implement that in, in real world politics. And it's really that that I want to um, try and work on in, in my writing in, in this talk. You know, how do we deliver uh, local agrarian livelihoods politically in the, in the real world? Thinking about that has led me uh, to read around the literature on agrarian populism. Um, so in, in, in many different countries, different times and places, there have been strong political movements. Um, organised uh, around the idea of, of small farmers, peasants as being the kind of economic backbone of society and a politics organised around their interests. Of course that isn't really the case anymore in the, in the UK where I live or in Germany. Uh, there's not very many people still involved in farming so you know, does that whole tradition of agrarian populism have lessons for us today? Um, I'm not sure, um, but a couple of books that I found of interest are Robert Netting's uh, Smallholders, Householders, and also Jan van der Plug's, uh, well, his work in general, and perhaps in particular his book, Peasants and the Art of Farming. And um, both of these books have led me to, to think that there are uh, potential structures of agrarian localism that are still with us, still kind of waiting in the wings, as it were, um, that we can tap into and realise if we choose to go um, in this direction, politically and economically. So I've, in the last few years, cautiously been uh, describing myself as an agrarian populist, um, and then all of a sudden all hell breaks loose in global politics, populism uh, is this, uh, you know, the, the, the political mainstream breaks open all these populist movements, populism becomes this disturbing and, and worrying trend in global politics. So how do I you know, how do I get my head around that, orient myself to that? Um, I found Chantal Mouffe's writing of interest, her book um, for a left populism. She defines populism as the people against the oligarchy. Uh, and she argues um, that, um, uh, that, that, that it's not a good idea to dismiss populism as a kind of throwback as an atavistic uh, sort of movement that has to be transcended, that it's something that needs to be embraced and, and turned into a progressive force, uh, something that can potentially renew democracy. Um, I guess the problem is as soon as you talk about the people against something, it raises the question of who are the people, how are you defining um, the people. And in most countries where populism, uh, populist movements have arisen, um, that is the, the, the critical question. Um, there tend to be sort of right and left wing populist versions of who the real people that the politics are articulating for are. 
in the UK right at the moment, or perhaps in England more than the UK, um, right-wing populism is, is very engaged with Brexit, um, and uh, certainly there's a strand of the press and the right-wing um, commentators who regard anybody who's uh, not in favour of a hard Brexit would be defined as uh, an enemy of the people. Um, I think that position is softening at the moment as the implications of Brexit are gradually beginning to dawn on us. Um, on the other hand, um, with the rise of Jeremy Corbyn to be leader of the Labour Party, there's a kind of left-wing populist um, move a, a, abroad, uh, which is very much more articulated against the economics of austerity um, and, and an argument that the real people are are the people who've, who've suffered um, financially through, um, through um, the, the policies of austerity. So, one of the criticisms of populist politics is that it tends to be this sort of very dualistic narrative of, of the people against some enemy of, of losers and winners. Um, so, Agrarian populism historically was very much a, a, a movement about the farmers, um, the, the ordinary people of the country, who were um, uh, uh, who were losing out to financial elites and needed to sort of wrest the political narrative uh, back from them, and that's sort of turned uh, you know in countries where there are no longer very many farmers, you know that kind of narrative has been um, taken over by left populism, an idea of sort of ordinary people against financial elites. On the right, um, it tends to have a nationalist framing, um, that, that, that the people are the nation as some kind of organic uh, national community um, who tend to be opposed to, uh, to liberal cosmopolitan elites or outsiders. Immigration, obviously, is a, is a, is, is a huge issue um, for right populists. Um, so it tends to be, uh, it does tend to be this potentially simplistic sort of uh, winner and loser narrative. Um, but I think some of the mainstream alternatives um, also have a sort of mythology of their own. Um, liberalism or neoliberalism um, tends to invoke the, the mythology of Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market. It sort of has a notion that everybody is a winner through more trade through um, market exchange, and in some senses it seems to me that the populist moment has arisen as, as that argument has become increasingly implausible that the, the market, that the global neoliberalism, uh, yeah, it doesn't make everybody a winner. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, sort of progressive argument that interests me is arguments about the commons and this notion that there is a kind of collective space <laughs> of self-organisation neither within the ambit of private markets nor the state in which if people can, can kind of wrest that space um, from the forces of enclosure uh, then you can have a, a, a kind of a people's commons in which again everybody is a, is a winner. Um, and I'm quite sympathetic to that view um, although my view is it, it hasn't really theorised the notion of how you create a personal livelihood out of that sort of collective public space terribly well. Um, so, uh, for, for better or worse, I tend to um, identify myself um, mostly with that, um, that, you know, that first bullet point as a kind of left agrarian populist position, uh, albeit aware of, of some of the, the, the sort of dualistic difficulties with it. So, that brings us right back into this problem of how we define the people that, that, um, that the populist uh, position is articulating for. Here is Chantal Mouffe's, I'm sorry, that's not probably very easy to read. <laughs> I could read it out to you if you like. Uh, I was hoping not to have to read it out, but um, her definition is, the people is not to be understood as an empirical referent or a sociological category. It is a discursive construction resulting from a chain of equivalence between heterogeneous demands whose unity is secured by an identification with a radical democratic conception of citizenship and a common opposition to the oligarchy, the forces that structurally impede the realisation of the democratic project. 
Um, now, in as much as I understand what she's saying, um, I think I agree with it. I think she's saying that we need a, a kind of non-essentialist definition of the people that is kind of um, structured in, in, in practice uh, through participation. But it seems to me quite hard to turn that into a, um, in, in, into a politics, into a story that you can easily sell to people. I think uh, the right-wing populists have a much easier time. Um, uh, and this is the worry. Um, uh, my feeling is that, um, yeah, right-wing populism has an easy story to sell, but it's not a good story. Not every country can be first. And obviously, there's a great danger that the people you define out of um, your community of, of the real people then become very vulnerable. So how's this all going to play out? Um, obviously, I have absolutely no idea. Um, but one possibility is the institutionalisation of populist politics. Um, that could be in the form of the authoritarian nationalisms that increasingly we're seeing in various countries. Or it could, from the left, be something more like a, a Green New Deal. It could be that the, the populist moment fades and um, we revert to um, uh, a, 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 the sort of business as usual, neoliberal transnationalism, <coughs> what Wolfgang Streeck is um, writings I find of interest is called the consolidation state. I guess my feeling is that all of those possible outcomes don't necessarily, uh, will be unable to overcome some of the contradictions and crises that I mentioned earlier, that they'll sort of paper over the cracks rather than satisfactorily resolving them. So what interests me to think about is what I've called in some of my writings, a, a supersedious state. Um, it's an idea I've stolen from beekeeping, just to ground it in something uh, agricultural again. But I guess the idea I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to drive at is um, the idea that Streets' consolidation state um, will sort of increasingly withdraw geographically from more peripheral areas that it, it can't necessarily deliver the material well-being um, that, um, that it has traditionally um, delivered and people have relied on, uh, without necessarily another um, state actor uh, rising to fill the breach so that people are still paying obeisance to the state and probably still paying some of their taxes to the state, um, but really have to begin to um, uh, take care of their own material well-being more directly. And in that situation, it's possible that um, non-state actors, potentially violent non-state actors, may rise to fill the breach, but potentially not. And this seems, I, mean, I guess this really is the, the space that I'm trying to argue for uh, where some of these um, possibilities for agrarian, uh, local agrarian livelihoods may, um, um, there may be something, sort of promising space for them to operate in there. And in some ways, in a lot of countries, they already are. Um, <clears throat> various other people have, beginning to write about these kind of futures. Peter Fraser's book, Four Futures, is one. I don't particularly agree with a lot of what Fraser has to say, but I found he has this little two-by-two two matrix um, that I found um, of interest where he divides potential political futures up, um, uh, firstly, in relation to possible futures of resource abundance or resource scarcity on the one hand, and then political equality on political hierarchy on the other. And it occurred to me um, that it is of interest to kind of split that uh, uh, into another, um, uh, across another dimension, which is essentially collective state um, uh, provision of the, uh, the economy, um, uh, the state sort of taking responsibility for delivering material well-being or that being a more bottom-up um, uh, process of personal livelihood creation. Uh, and it's, so it's that box there which I've labelled agrarian populism. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is a bit of a, a, a sort of superficial exercise in some ways, filling these different traditions into these boxes. But this is basically what interests me, a future of resource scarcity, I think, uh, political equality that needs to be fought for, but the creation of personal uh, livelihood. Um, 
And so just to wrap up the talk, um, I guess I want to think a little bit about what that might look like um, on the ground. Um, I guess I want to ask sort of questions about material well-being. So questions like, where does my food come from? Um, this lovely buffet that we had uh, just a few minutes ago. So who produced that? Uh, why did they produce it for us? Under what circumstances? And the more I think about this, the more I tend to come uh, down on a kind of an argument for producerism rather than consumerism as a way of transcend transcending those sort of win-win narratives in circumstances of relative resource scarcity. So that pushes me towards these uh, sort of agrarian populist arguments for um, what's often called family farming or neo-peasantries within that space of the supersedia state as a kind of emergent agrarian political communities. But that immediately raises all sorts of problems, questions, contradictions. Gender is a key one, obviously, as soon as you start talking about family farming, um, what, what does that mean? Um, commerce is another one. You know, how, does the, how, is, how does the farm organize itself as a, as a self-productive unit versus a trading unit? Um, and I'm just beginning to read some of the literature on civic republicanism. Um, it's, um, I guess my political reading tends to be quite anglophone, so be, I don't know how this plays out in terms of um, German political traditions. Um, although certainly Habermas has written quite a lot of interesting stuff about this. Um, um, but, um, yeah, I'm interested in civic republicanism as a political tradition um, uh, for assembling these new um, political communities as participatory political communities and trying to deal with some of these contradictions that I mentioned. And there is a long tradition of um, arguments for smallholder republicanism um, within modernity. It's a kind of what I call a sort of shadow modernist tradition because it's lost most of the key arguments over time with arguments for liberal um, commercialism. Um, but as, as, as those arguments or as that tradition begins to run into crisis and hit the buffers, um, seems to me that the, the time is, is, is right for thinking about that uh, republican tradition, civic republicanism in general, and the way it's articulated around agrarian livelihood in particular, um, as a useful political tradition um, to, um, to invoke. One of the problems with that, um, I guess, is that classic uh, smallholder republican arguments tend to be grounded in a, um, a, a notion of a very demographically stable society. Um, you know, it's a kind of society it's of, um, uh, of, of peasant producers, um, uh, you know, small farm, well-established societies. And that's not really the world that we're in at the moment. Huge um, mobility. Uh, immigration, clearly a huge issue, and uh, climate change, refugeeism, I think is increasing, the, the sort of huge population movements are increasingly going to be um, a, a, a big issue in the future. Um, so one way of thinking would be that that is a, a, an obstacle to those arguments for uh, agrarian republicanism that are based on that, that more kind of stable demographic. Um, Sorry, I should have mentioned Mimi Scheller's book that I just read recently, <coughs> Mobility Justice, in which she's arguing um, uh, for the need um, for, um, for, the, for the mobility in the present world to, you know, to, to be um, accorded you know, for, for, for the rights of mobile people, essentially. But it occurs to me um, that that is potentially also an opportunity um, for, the, um, for the civic republican traditions um, to articulate around um, people uh, having to form new political communities without um, a, a, you know, any sort of notion of, a, of an organic identity in the past um, and, and to form them as a community of practice, you know, creating agrarian livelihoods um, in this, um, this, this space of the supersedure state as, as communities of agrarian practice. Um, and so clearly that brings us back to the, you know, the two, the Chantal Mouffe versus Donald Trump um, problem. Um, uh, I'm less familiar than I should be with German politics, but my sense is that Germany recently has taken um, 
um, a, a, a quite a positive um, stance towards mobility and immigration and refugees, and there's been considerable political blowback against that. So this seems to me that I'd, I'd be interested to learn from you um, your thoughts on that and the implications um, for grounding um, a, um, a, 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 a sensible future agrarian politics in that context, because that seems to me to be the, the key political battle that, um, that we face uh, in order to, um, to, to move these arguments for uh, a, a kind of agrarian republicanism forward. And I think that's pretty much where I, um, I will leave it and um, hopefully um, learn from you. Thank you.